I've heard quite a few people say they refuse to watch Revolutionary Girl Utena because they believe it to be pushing propaganda. And on the contrary, I've heard people claim they hate anime, but somehow love Utena. Few even going so far to say it represents everything they believe. Honestly, both sides of the argument make me laugh, because it's clear they have no respect for the art form, and they solely judge it on their own independently held beliefs rather than the show's own intrinsic value. Many of the people who criticize Revolutionary Girl Utena claim it is pushing a feminist agenda, which may have been true in the late 90s when this show was first released, but compared to modern day shows that have female knights guarding the king in medieval fantasies, or a high school where the female students don robotic battle armor to protect the planet, Revolutionary Girl Utena is quite tame. I've heard people who claim Utena is propaganda, but praise Attack on Titan for its masculinity. Somehow they manage to overlook this. And this. This too. Also these. And another for the road. The main character of Revolutionary Girl Utena has long flowing pink hair and sports athletic shorts along with a dress shirt that most men would not be caught dead wearing. The girls in Attack on Titan wear the exact same military outfit as the boys, and use the exact same equipment. Mikasa, the most prevalent female character, has her hair cut short, more like a boy's hairstyle, rather than the typical woman's style. Utna's masculine traits are her ability to excel at sports, and her ability to duel in the sport of fencing. Whereas in Attack on Titan, many of the best Titan hunters are actually women. Attack on Titan actually had many of the male characters be more emotional than the female characters. And one of the most masculine characters in the series was a clean freak who during those said periods would wear a bandana to keep his hair clean. So Attack on Titan basically has more traditionally female traits apply to more of the male characters than its female characters. So if anything, the modern show praised for its masculinity is pushing more of an agenda than revolutionary girl Utena. Because the two protagonists are women, some people might turn away from watching this series, but actually the conflicts of the main characters are actually universal themes that can apply to everyone. The main character Utena, when she was a child, was rescued by a man that looked like a prince, and she desired to become more like the man who rescued her. Her desire to become a prince could also be considered as trying to avoid being helpless, and the feeling of being helpless is a universal theme amongst all humans. For example, if a man had a flat tire on his car and required someone to change it for him, he would be similar to Utena in that situation. So if later that man tried to learn how to change his own flat tires, he would be no different than Utena trying to become more self-reliant. Now on to Anthe, whose conflict I actually prefer. Anthe was raised to be the Rose Bride, whose role is to marry whoever is the best duelist, or to make it simple, the best fencer at her school. The character of Anthe is portrayed as cold, emotionless, and dedicated to her future husband. She would even go so far as to betray her friends at the behest of her future husband. The main theme behind Anthe's character is that she is being groomed into what other people want her to be, and the character of Utena is trying to prevent her from becoming that person, which makes Utena reminiscent of her prince. The final scene of the anime proves that this was the main idea of the story, that has Anthe's feet briefly stop at the gate to leave school, and then walk through as cheery upbeat music starts to play. This scene represents Ansi breaking free of her bondage and finally choosing to do something for herself rather than her manipulators. The theme of being controlled and groomed to another's will is another universal theme that everyone can relate to. This somewhat even applies to the male characters of the story, but just to a lesser degree. This idea is prevalent in another manga that was released the following year after this anime aired, and that manga was Hunter Hunter. The Hunter Hunter character, Killua, is very similar to Anthe in this regard. Killua was born into a family of assassins, and his parents tried desperately to make him take up the family business. To groom Killua into the family business, his family tried to prevent him from making friends and tortured him when he left the house without permission. The family even went so far as to use mind control tactics to manipulate him into becoming an assassin. Anthe is a character that likes gardening, and Killua is a character that likes fighting. Anthe is female, Killua is male. They are both pretty much complete opposite characters of each other. But the fact that they are both being groomed against their will makes the idea behind these characters that are completely opposite from each other intersect and thus makes them both universal. Men might turn away from this show because they think it's a chick flick. But many of the ideas in this story are actually present in male-oriented media. So a person that doesn't like female issues can view this as a human issue instead. 
Whenever I finish an anime that many consider a deep and meaningful show, I typically like to hear other people's interpretations of the show. I was honestly disappointed in most of the videos explaining this show. Because most of the videos are about how this show affirms their own beliefs, and how they can relate to the, the two main characters, which I have no problem with. But the videos always seem superficial, and barely scratch the surface on why this show is so popular 20 years later after its release. I've actually seen videos where the most they said about the imagery was that it was surreal, which to me is surreal because this show's imagery is some of the best in all of anime. Because many other videos lack explanation on why this anime's imagery is so fascinating, I will say why I enjoyed the imagery so much. Many other shows have surrealism just for the sake of having surrealism, whereas this uses surrealistic imagery for the purpose of reflecting the psyche of the characters. There is this one recurring scene nearing the end of the story which involved different characters but the situation was always the same. This scene always would have a confused character during a stressful period riding in the back of a fancy sports car. And the car always zooms through a highway on a dimly lit night. And the character would be somewhat manipulated by the driver of this car. The viewer could not see beyond the road due to the night and the absence of light, which happened to be a metaphor for the character's confused state of mind so that they could not sink clearly. The fact that the character was being driven by someone else symbolized how they were not in control of themselves and were being manipulated. Another scene that expertly showcases a character's psyche in the show is when Nanami, the student council president's non-blood-related sister, leans her hands on the back of a car. Nanami looks like a model, a person's object of desire. And the whole idea behind Nanami's character is that she wants to be seen as beautiful by everyone and accepted by her older brother. So having her look attractive in the position of a mudflap girl personifies her desire to look beautiful to everyone. The show also uses imagery to show Utena's occasional doubt if she truly wishes to be a prince. Like in this one scene where Utena stares into a mirror to reflect on her life. There's also a dreamlike sequence in the final episodes where Utena has a dress magically appear on her in a duel where she is being overwhelmed against a man who is trying to end her desire of becoming a prince. Also present during the final episodes are the use of swords and roses as symbolic imagery. Swords were used to restrain Anthe to prevent her from moving, potentially foiling the final battle. Roses were used in a similar manner. The roses were used like chains to keep a door shut that could potentially free Anthe. Both of these are relevant as symbols because they are tied to the idea of Anthe being the Rose Bride. Anthe was restrained by swords to mimic her servitude to the winner of the duel, who uses swords. And the roses were being used as chains, which mimics Anthe being chained to the role of the Rose Bride. Revolutionary girl Utna also had creative imagery through the use of shadows. Many times throughout the series, characters' clothes and various outfits would be seen, but the characters' faces would be covered with shadow. Characters' faces not being visible heavily implies that they might be putting on a fake persona and are only appearing to be the person that they are because of the clothes that they wear. So this idea works well with the characters, especially Utena, how she is a princess that wants to be a prince, and how a seemingly kind character can be the antagonist who manipulates others to his own will. One of the more memorable recurring scenes of the show involved silhouettes of dolls appearing on a wall, where they would retell the moral of the current episode and would answer and resolve the issues of the episode. These shadowy figures acted like the Greek chorus in the plays of olden times. The chorus would typically represent the audience, or be the voice of reason, in the play, and these faceless characters act in the same manner as the Greek chorus. One thing that always amused me about this show was how it emphasized insignificant moments. One instance of this was when Utena was carrying another girl up a hill on her back, and the motions were heavily animated to make their legs appear very dangly. Another instance was when Utena was on her back in bed and started to move her legs up and down. Probably just to exercise, but they put a lot of effort into animating it. I'm not sure of the importance of either of these scenes, but I've also been intrigued by the fact that they put so much effort into such an unimportant action. Revolutionary girl Utna excelled at making the layout of the setting, almost to the point of feeling tangible, that if I was in that world, I could make my way around. Like if I went through the forest, I would find this building, or if I go through this hall, I would wind up at the greenhouse and see Anthe gardening. One of the ways the show's environment felt believable, and that you can actually navigate through the world, was through the use of recurring scenes. One of these recurring scenes was the introduction to the start of a duel, 
and during the scene, Utsna would enter an elevator surrounded by a circular staircase, and the elevator would propel her to the top of the building, the dueling area. Because the show had, had her use an elevator, you could tell she was up high, on the roof. This was supported by the fact that the sky was always present, and in some of the earlier episodes, Utena would be nearly knocked off of the edge. Occasionally, onlookers would watch the duel from another building, and the onlookers would have to tilt their heads downwards, and would have to use binoculars to watch the duel. This gave the viewer a sense of distance and height between the two buildings. The use of binoculars meant that the building was far away and could not be seen clearly with the naked eye and the fact that the onlookers had to tilt their head downwards meant that the building they were on was taller than the building where the duels took place. This aspect was another reason why I said the show was great at utilizing insignificant details. Another recurring scene that I previously mentioned that was great at establishing the tangibility of the setting was the dreamlike driving sequence where a character was being manipulated. This scene always took place on the exact same road, and the scene would always end with a slight curve after the character was manipulated. So because this scene was frequently used, the viewer always knew where the car would be despite the fact that the road was barely visible. The show was also masterful with the use of perspective. For example, an important scene would take place in front of a building, and in a few episodes later you can see that exact same building, but from a different angle, which takes place in an enclosed external hallway, which makes the setting feel real and lifelike as opposed to just random drawings meant to fit a specific scene. The show also went the extra mile with perspective to show certain hallways from multiple angles. It would start with the character walking towards the camera, then switch to move parallel along with the camera, and finally the camera would change positions behind the character. Most shows would have stayed at one angle, just to cut costs on the expenses, but this show went the extra mile and it paid off by helping the viewer get a sense of depth in the hallway, and because of the change between perspectives, more information about the location is revealed. Like how at the beginning of this montage, the viewer would have thought the hallway was inside a building, but it turned out that the hallway was an external hallway, and the campus was actually visible from inside the hall. The show's architecture resembles French castles, and along with the heavy use of flowers, this gives the show a unique, whimsical atmosphere, which complemented the various scenes of the story since it involves princes and princesses, and masters and servants. Despite the fact that the setting was masterfully crafted and drawn well, that wasn't what made the setting so great. What made the setting so great was how well it was used. The setting helped the viewers to understand the world through the creative uses of repetition, perspective, depth, and careful editing. My goal of this video was to encourage more people to watch Revolutionary Girl Utna. I was one of the people that was hesitant at first to watch this show. And I was wrong. Even if you don't like the idea of the show, there are so much valuable, worthwhile aspects of this show that anyone can enjoy. Whether it be the technical aspects or the creative use of imagery, there are so many reasons to watch this show. And if you've already watched this show and enjoyed it, I hope I was able to give you a richer and deeper appreciation of this show. Thanks for watching my video. If you're interested in more of my content, next week I have a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure video coming up. Thanks again.